Hi, I'm Paul. And I'm Ming. And welcome to Skip the Rule Book, your guide through the caves of the rule book, leading you to the daylight of your new game. Today we are lost in the dark in Subterra. In this game, you're falling into the unknown rocky depths with just your skills and a rapidly failing flashlight. You must explore, climb, dive, and dodge the faceless horrors in order to survive. Unfortunately, no amount of rubbing those batteries will get your torch going again. Let's skip the rule book. Not going to need this. Once inside the box, you will find the caver boards. These are the brave delves of the unknown that you'll have the option of playing. Each board will tell you their stats, as well as any special skills possessed by each one. Throughout the course of the game, you'll be making your way through uncharted caverns and caves in search of the exit. The game board is built as you play, by placing the cave tiles, which carry the tunnels and hazards of a subterranean world. You'll also find the cave tile holder. This will require some construction, but can be used to hold the cave tiles during play. Caving is a perilous pastime, even when things are going well. But in this case, things are about to get even more dangerous. The hazard cards indicate random events, which will cause floods, cave-ins, and more sinister dangers to strike. There are a myriad of tokens which accompany the hazard cards, which are placed onto the cave tiles when these events occur. They allow you to keep track of everything from a blocked path to a water-filled chamber. Your intrepid adventurers are represented by wooden pieces, with the colour of each piece relating to a specific specialist, as indicated by the background colour of your caver board. If you bought the deluxe version of the game, these pieces can be replaced by the miniatures which represent each caver. As well as the hazard tokens, there are some more helpful ones. The health tokens will allow you to keep track of how hardy your cavers are. The rope tokens will allow you to traverse any dangerous routes. And the explosive tokens will help you get through any pesky walls. We also have a starting player marker to indicate who's taking point on each turn and a dice to randomise things during play. Finally, we have two sets of cards. The character cards are not used during play, but will allow you to add a bit more depth to your characters. The summary cards will then allow you to keep track of the actions available to you each turn. In Subterra, you take the role of a group of cavers who have found themselves lost in the depths as a result of a freak accident. Your goal is to escape by exploring the cave in order to find the exit. Each player should begin by choosing a caver board and taking the corresponding wooden caver piece. In a two or three player game, each player should choose two boards and thus take on the role of two cavers. Cover each health space on your caver board with a health point token. Then place any unused boards back in the box. Locate the starting cave tile and place it in the centre of the play area. The exit tile should then be placed to one side, and the remaining 64 tiles shuffled and placed face down in a stack to form our draw pile. If you're using the cave tile holder, you can place them inside it now. The exit tile should now be shuffled into the bottom five tiles of the stack. This adds a little randomness to the game, as the exit could be anywhere within the last six tiles. Then, each player should place their cave of pieces onto the start tile. Next, we arrange the hazard deck. As Subterra is decidedly the players versus the game, you do have the option of setting your difficulty to Normal, Advanced or Expert. If you're playing a normal game, remove all hazard cards with this symbol. If you're playing advanced, remove these, and if you're playing expert, remove these and these. The difficulty also dictates the number of hazard cards used. 
Once you've removed the correct cards for your chosen difficulty, count out a number of cards as indicated by this table. As we are playing a normal game with four cavers, we will use 22 hazard cards. Once the hazard deck is built, place the out of time card on the bottom and place all remaining hazard cards back in the box as they won't be used during this game. Finally, the starting player marker should be given to the last player who ventured below ground. Thank you. Since we're using two cavers each, I'll give the marker to this chap. We should each then take a summary card. The game is broken into a series of turns, with the game length being dictated by how long it takes you to either escape or fail in the attempt. Each turn is comprised of a number of phases, action, horror, hazard and the end phase. During the action phase, each player takes it in turns to complete actions using their cavers by spending action points. Each caver begins with two of these. To begin, I will use my starting caver and elect for a nice safe action, Reveal. When you choose this action, select one of the open paths leading from your current tile, then take one of the tiles from the top of the draw stack and place it so that one of the paths on your new tile matches up with your selected one. The next action I can choose is the move action. This also costs one action point. To use this action, simply move your caver from its current tile to an adjacent connected tile. Once you've spent all action points with a given caver, play moves around to the next one clockwise. Since we're using two cavers each, that means that I can now complete my actions with my second caver. While using the reveal action may be the safest way to proceed, it's also not the fastest and time is of the essence, as we must find the exit before we run out of hazard cards. For the first action with my next caver, I will therefore elect to pick up the pace and use the explore action. When you explore, you're essentially running into the unknown. Pick an open path from your current tile, select a new one from the top of the stack, and place it face up connected to the path you chose. The difference now is that since I chose the explore action rather than reveal, I moved my caver directly onto it. While this could put me in harm's way, it also only costs one action point, so now I can do it again. As you explore, you will find tiles that have a range of graphics and symbols. These indicate possible hazards on these tiles. This one, for example, is the cave-in symbol. Hazards will not cause us a problem till later in the turn, so we can ignore this for now. With Paul's caver's turns now completed, we move on to mine. I will start as Paul did by using the reveal action to check out the path ahead. Hmm. This tile represents a narrow gap in the cave that I cannot move through without taking some extra care, so I cannot simply move on to it using the move action. To move on to a squeeze tile, you have to use the squeeze action. Unfortunately, this takes two action points and I only have one left. Luckily, I do have an option. Exerting. At any time during your turn, you can elect to have one of your cavers exert themselves in order to gain an extra action point for that turn. To do this, you must roll a skill check. This simply means you roll a die and must aim to score a four or more in order to succeed. If you fail a skill check for exertion, you must lose a health point by removing one of your health point markers from your board. Since I passed, I now gain my extra action point and can move into this narrow passageway. It should be mentioned that if your caver moves on to a squeeze tile as a result of the explore action, you do not have to pay the extra action point. Otherwise, the squeeze action is the only way to move onto these tiles. With my next caver, I'm now going to explore down the last open passageway. Well, that's a problem. I've drawn a slide tile. Slide tiles must be placed so that the arrow faces away from the revealing caver's current tile, like so. You can move onto a slide tile normally from either direction. However, you cannot move back across the slide. The slope is too steep and you cannot climb back up it. This means that any future move actions would have to be in the other direction. Our party is now split up and I could be in trouble. 
I think for my second action, I'll proceed with more caution with a reveal. Well, this ledge tile, much like the slide tile, effectively blocks your path. As with the slide tile, it must be placed so that the arrow faces away from the revealing caver's tile. Unlike the slide, it blocks your path ahead rather than behind. Cavers cannot move, explore, or reveal across a ledge. This means effectively, I'm trapped in this little space. Don't worry though, I'm a caver, and I've got some tricks up my sleeve to get myself out of this mess next turn. Once all cavers have completed their actions, we now end the turn. This would normally start with the horror phase, but as we've not encountered any horrors yet, we can skip this phase for now. In the hazard phase, simply draw the top card of the hazard deck. This will indicate the nature of the hazard that you'll face this turn. This cave-in card means that there has been a rock fall somewhere in the caverns. Roll the die, and then compare that number with the tiles already on the table. If any of the cave-in tiles matches that number, then there has been a cave-in there. Annoyingly, that roll of a 3 means that there's been a cave-in on the tile occupied by my red caver. I place a rubble marker there, and must then remove 3 health from any caver who occupies that tile. For most cavers, this would mean losing all of their health. If this happens, then your caver has fallen unconscious. Place it on its side, and from now on, this caver cannot complete actions. Luckily, however, my bodyguard is made of tougher stuff. With the hazard phase complete, we now finish up the turn with the end phase. The starting caver marker is moved round to the next caver, which in this case means it passes to my bodyguard. This caver currently finds himself buried in rubble. The rubble marker prevents passage of cavers into this tile, which means that while my caver could move out, nobody else can move in. I will therefore begin my turn by using the dig action. This costs two points and will allow me to remove a rubble marker from my current or adjacent tile. Since I'm low on health and a bit lonely, I will now try and get back to the group. I will exert and move one space with my extra action point. I'm going to keep striving forward now by exploring. Not only have I found a dead end, but I've also found the den of a possible horror. It would take me two action points to be able to move back into the squeeze tile. I only have one left after my explore action. Cavers do not have to spend all of their action points during their turn, so I will pass and stay where I am. With my second caver, I'm now going to try and get myself out of trouble. As an action, you may place a rope over a slide or a ledge. You pay two action points and must roll a skill check. If you succeed, like so, you may place a rope token onto the slide or ledge tile that you're currently on. In future turns, cavers can now move freely over this tile. I will now carry on with my next caver by exploring. The rough terrain tile is another bit of dangerous ground. When you enter a rough terrain tile, you must make a skill check. If you fail, like I just did, then you must lose one point of health. You will notice that this tile has four exits, which means it doesn't match up on all sides with open paths. If you draw a tile that doesn't match with the neighbouring tiles, then you only have to worry about connecting it correctly with the tile your caver came from. In this game, it never does well to be alone and injured, so I'm now going to exert myself and spend my two remaining action points to get back to the group. By spending two points, you can choose to run. This means that you can move up to three tiles. While running, you must still follow the rules for tiles which restrict movement. This means that you cannot run into a squeeze tile or one filled with rubble. With our actions finished, we now end the turn. The horror phase only affects horrors that are already on the board. So although we have a potential horror spawn site here, we can ignore this phase for now and move on to the hazard phase. Hmm, I think we may have a problem. When you draw a horror card, you must spawn a horror, as indicated by one of these purple wooden tokens. You must spawn the horror following these simple rules. 
the horror must be placed on a horror tile that does not already currently contain a horror, and that is the fewest tiles away from a cave-shaped victim. If there is ever a tie for the tile that the horror should spawn onto, the starting player should intervene and choose. There can only ever be a maximum of three horrors on the board at once. Once horrors have spawned, any horrors that were already on the board will now move. Since this one has only just appeared, we don't have to worry about this for now. Horrors could represent any number of monsters from the deep, but suffice to say they are a bad thing. If a horror ever occupies the same tile as a caver, that caver now loses all health and falls unconscious. Finish up by placing the horror marker on top of the hazard deck to ensure we remember to complete the horror phase in future turns. With the turn over, the starting player marker now passes to my engineer. While she would now get to go first this turn, she's unconscious so doesn't get any actions, and play passes straight over to my diver. Your cavers will inevitably get injured during play, and one of the actions you have available to you is the heal action. You spend two action points and get to replenish one health token on your own board, or that of a caver who occupies the same tile as you. All cavers have some special skill or skills that will help you throughout the game. Some of these are passive, which will alter the way that normal actions work. My medic has got two additional skills that he can use as well as the normal ones. The first is called Sprint, and will allow me to move two squares for a single action point. The second is called Bandage, and will allow me to heal a caver on the same tile as my medic, again for only a single action point. The special skills will mean that your cavers will tend to take on particular roles during the game if used correctly. I'll now finish up my turn by using both of my bodyguard's actions to heal himself for one health point. This turn we do have a horror on the board so must complete the horror phase. During the horror phase, or whenever a horror hazard card is drawn, any horrors on the board will move one tile towards their closest victim. Although horrors cannot move through solid walls, they can move unimpeded through any tile type. If there are two or more possible victims of equal distance from the horror, the horror will move towards the victim of the lowest rank, as indicated by the number on the bottom right of your caver board. If during its movement, the horror is more than seven tiles away from its closest victim, then that horror is removed from the board. As before, we finish up with the hazard phase. This tremor card means there's been an earthquake throughout the caves. Each conscious caver must roll a skill check and lose one health point if they fail. The aim of the game is to find the exit tile and have all cavers move safely onto it. Any cavers on the exit tile cannot lose health for any reason and can never be chosen as a victim by a horror. When you draw the out of time card, your flashlight batteries have finally run out of power and you are scrabbling in the dark. During all future hazard phases, each caver, including those who are unconscious, must roll a skill check. If you fail, you have been devoured by a horror and removed from the game. The game continues until all remaining cavers are on the exit tile or there are no cavers left. Once the game ends, you must determine how well you did. If all of your cavers made it safely, then you earn a gold victory. One caver left behind will earn you a silver victory, while two cavers lost will earn you a bronze. If three or more of your cavers were lost in the dark, then you have been defeated by the dangers of the cave. There are two additional hazards that we have not yet mentioned. While exploring the cave, you'll come across tiles with the water graphic on. These water tiles can be entered freely, but there is a chance they will flood. If during the hazard phase you draw a flood card, you must place a flood marker on any water tiles that don't already have one. Any cavers on these tiles will immediately lose one health. In future turns you can only enter these flooded tiles by using the swim action, which costs two action points. The final hazard is gas. The gas tiles, much like the water, are freely passable throughout the game. If a gas hazard card is drawn, however, they become more dangerous. Any caver who occupies a gas tile when the gas hazard card is drawn will lose two health points. Additionally, for the next turn, any caver who enters a gas tile will also lose two health. 
This remains in play until the next hazard phase when that card is covered up. To remind you of this, place the gas hazard token on top of the tile draw pile until the danger is passed. That's it from us at Skip the Rulebook. If you found this video useful, please press like. If you want to hear more from Skip the Rulebook, press subscribe. You can also find out more about us on Facebook, Twitter, and skiptherulebook.com. Join us next time for your chance to jump into that brand new board game of yours without doing any of the tedious rule reading. See you later. Can I start that again, please? Yep. It's not going well, Poopy. It's okay, Mookie. Bondage and sprinting. A caver on the same tile as my, uh, oh, caver card. Caver board. In order to... In oh. order to... <laughs> The <laughs> safest way to depress. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> this cave in tile me. Nope. Uh, bye. Uh, bye. Sorry. Oh, bye. Well, that would have been great if that was the real thing. Bye.